This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number 28. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey everybody, it's Matt. It's great to be back here in session 28 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I had uh, just gotten back from Denver uh, for ABAI. I think it was the the 43rd one. My gosh, uh, not the 43rd one for me, certainly, but uh, by the end of the weekend, it certainly felt like it. And uh, it was a really fun time out there. I got to meet lots of guests that I've only known through Skype and certainly have made some connections about uh, future guests and things like that as well. So all in all, a great time was had. And I really also want to thank everyone for coming out and checking out our panel discussion on supervision. It was a uh, it was kind of a packed room. I was shocked. You know, last year when I gave a uh, or participated in a panel at the uh, ABAI in Chicago, there was probably, I don't know, a dozen people in the room, maybe 20 or something like that. And uh, it seemed like there was closer to 150 or 200 in this particular room. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a little bit nerve wracking. I'm going to be honest with you, especially since I got lost in the convention center and ended up showing up <laughs> about a minute or two into the panel discussion itself. So uh, yeah, that was a little bit embarrassing. But uh, anywho, I uh, was able to uh, diffuse those private events and slog through it. So again, thanks for uh, for coming to it if you came and I had a chance to meet so many listeners and I really appreciate everyone taking the time to come over and say hi or uh, those of you or you know send emails or Facebook messages and things like that really appreciate everyone checking out the show and if you're new to the podcast this is a podcast where we talk to uh, people doing cool stuff in the world of applied behavior analysis and today is no exception in today's episode I speak with Molly Ola Penny who is the CEO of the Global Autism Project And if you don't know what that is, well, stay tuned. She tells a really cool story about how she started the organization. The Cliff Notes version is basically, uh, I guess, the Global Autism Project provides services in areas of the world where there are very little, if any, behavior analytic services, uh, services to kids on the spectrum in particular. And so, again, Molly tells us about how she got into this, how kind of saying yes to these kind of random opportunities opened up lots of doors, and she tells a story about what it's like to manage a, 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 an organization that you know has people all over the world. So there's, a, I think, lessons in here for uh, anybody, regardless of where you are in this field. Before we get to Molly's interview, I do want to let you know that today's podcast is sponsored by Britain Behavioral Consulting. Uh, that is the supervision and consultation services of Dr. Lisa Britton, that's B-R-I-T-T-O-N, not Britton like the country, and I mentioned her briefly in session 27 of the podcast, and what Lisa does is she provides high-quality independent fieldwork supervision to BCBA candidates. You know, I get asked from time to time to provide supervision. Most of the time, I, I turn those requests down just because I don't have the bandwidth to do it. You know, I want to make sure that when I am uh, contemplating providing supervision that I can give supervisees uh, all that I can to help them be successful. Well, Lisa specializes in this. This is kind of what she does. And so for those of you who are having difficulty finding a supervisor, or if you're, say, like a clinic owner, and it makes more sense to hire out that service, or or at least to supplement your supervision with uh, another resource, it makes sense to check out BrittonBehavioralConsulting.com. That's B-R-I-T-T-O-N, BehavioralConsulting.com. And uh, I'm going to have Lisa uh, as a guest in an upcoming episode. We're going to do a deep dive into, uh, you know, best practices for providing supervision, especially providing supervision remotely using uh, Skype or FaceTime or whatever. So... I am really looking forward to having that conversation. But in the meantime, and without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Molly Olapini. Molly Olapini, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. I'm great. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. Well, as you know, we've been kind of chatting 
on and off for a, a, what is it, a couple months now trying to get something scheduled. And so I'm glad we actually found a time to chat about uh, both you and your organization. And I'm looking forward to sharing this information with our listeners. So um, as, as I've uh, probably described in the introduction, you are uh, with the Global Autism Project. And I'll let you kind of fill in the blanks in terms of what your role is and things like that. But as I typically like to do, I want to start off with asking you how you got into autism and into this field and things like that. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, take a few minutes and kind of describe, you know, how you got from point A to point B. Sure, absolutely. Not the most direct route, I think. There's probably easier ways from point A to point B. I was actually living in Seattle, Washington. I had finished up an AmeriCorps program, working with kids suspended from school, who in hindsight, there was definitely some, some folks on the spectrum in that group, but I didn't know at the time, really. And a family asked me to babysit for their son um, who had autism. And so I did. I babysat because why not? And a few days later, they told me that they'd love for me to become trained as what we were calling in those days an ABA therapist. Mm -hmm. And I had studied behavioral neuroscience in college. So I knew a thing or two about LOVAS and ABA. Um, and that's really all I knew, that that was who started it and kind of what it looked like. Um, and I said, sure, yeah, that's that's something that I could learn how to do. Cause why not? Um, were you a psych so major? That, uh, neuroscience. Okay. So that was, so that was kind of my, my start and it was, that was it. I mean, and, and that was it. That's, I've been doing it now for, Oh, about 15 or 16 years. So a little while. What was the training like at that point in time? Cause it's obviously very different than the ABA landscape as we know it these days. Right. I know, I know. I feel like I'm an old dinosaur. Like, tell us what it was like when you were little. Um, <laughs> what was the training like? You know, I was really fortunate. I worked with some great people in Seattle, Washington. I felt really great about the training that I had received. They had a huge emphasis on training, um, very competency based, very observational. Um, everything that I was learning, I was applying instantly. I mean, I wasn't going to school for this, right? I was literally learning in this kid's ABA therapy room that the family had set up you know, with the BCBA sitting on the futon behind me and saying, try this. And I'd try this thing and it would work or it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd, we'd talk about that. I was also trained specifically in fluency based precision teaching. So that's something that is highly data intensive. Um, and you can see right away if you're making progress with the child for sure. Um, Did you do the that, charting and all that stuff? Yeah, I love the chart. Oh my gosh. That's such a <laughs> I don't want to say polarizing issue, but it's something it that yeah, the people who who love it love it. The people like yeah. myself who are not well versed in it run away at the at the at the sight or sound of that uh, those yeah. words. And I've uh, I, I've chatted with uh, Rick Cabina a couple of times about oh, yeah. coming on the on the podcast to kind of uh, get us up to speed or you know I guess desensitize <laughs> people like myself. But anyway, so yeah. get, so I'm getting us a little off track here. Let's. <laughs> To, let's uh, let's continue with the story. Sure. So, um, where was I? So, part of the reason, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but part of the reason that I was willing to do this with this family is because they were moving to West Africa in a year, specifically to Ghana. And I thought, well, that's cool for them. Um, I'm not doing that. The time I had an undergraduate degree to finish, and I thought that will be good. And so I can do this thing for a year. And in my head, I thought I'd become a developmental pediatrician. Um, so I thought I'll do this for a year. And what a great experience to have spent one year working in a home program with a kid. Um, and so speaking of that chart, we were looking at some of the data he or some of the progress he'd made and looking at some phase changes and figuring out what was kind of going to be realistic once they got to Ghana. Um, so I don't entirely remember how this unfolded, but next thing I knew I was getting my first passport ever and I was going to move to Ghana with these guys. So really? yeah, that whole thing like, oh, they're leaving in a year. So this will be good for me for the time being. Um, I moved to Ghana with them and that is where the story of the global autism project begins. So were you, uh, were you done with school at that point or did you take like time off to, to do? I to took time off because I had done an AmeriCorps program and took time off. And then I enjoyed taking time off and I thought, you know, <laughs> let me eat, right? <laughs> right? Like, this is amazing. Why would I do anything else? Um, and I loved working with this kid and I just, I, I mean, I loved it. So, you know, I picked up some nannying jobs so that I'd have enough income to be able to work with this kid 12 hours a week. And, um, before I moved to Ghana, I ended up working with more kids, which was 
amazing. Now I knew more than one kid with autism and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, that's how it all started. Very, very humble beginnings. <laughs> so, so you are kind of in the middle of, of your, I guess, uh, uh undergraduate uh, yeah. process. And, uh, so you go to, you know, um, you, you go to Africa and, and how long do you stay over there for? Did you say a year? Was it? So I ended up staying for about two years. Oh, wow. uh, what happened is I got to Ghana and part of my role was going to be one, helping this child acclimate to this new school in this new country. I mean, how hard can it be? How different can it be? Right. I don't know what we were all thinking. Um, and then the other part of my role was training somebody to take over for me so that, you know, the family knew that when they moved to Ghana, they were going to have to bring their own therapist, um, that there wasn't going to be anybody there who was trained in this um, and they also, I think on some level though we didn't talk about it too much, we're aware of the stigma around autism in general. And so I got to Ghana and people started showing up at the school where I was working. They started showing up at the house where I was living. They started showing up places where I'd hang out after school in my free time. Um, and they were looking for the person who knew what autism was. And I sort of looked around like, who, who are you, <laughs> you know, like, who are you looking for? What are you talking about? Um, you know, I had been trained for about a year, um, but that was more training than anybody around me had. And so, um, you know, I realized pretty quickly that there was, there was a pretty huge need. I mean, I had people showing up to the school looking for me. I met a woman who had started an autism center in Ghana. She had lived in the U.S. for some time with her son, gone back to Ghana, seen that there were no services available, and started a center. Um, so meeting her was really this incredible moment where I was like, yes, someone's doing this. Great. Um, you know, my first thought was, oh, I want to go work at that school so that I can learn how to do this. Cause I've only been doing this for a year, but I'm going to learn from all these people. And I'm so glad we found them. Um, and what I found is that they needed while they had, and I cannot underscore this enough while they had the just incredible instincts. I mean, if you are not trained in this and you're spending all day in a center with kids who are everywhere on the autism spectrum, although generally on the more severe end, you develop some really incredible instincts around these kids. Um, not to mention, you know, they knew, they knew the kids, they knew the country, they knew the culture. And um, back to the stigma piece, you know, if you're working with kids with autism in Ghana, it's not the same as it is for us here. You know, when we say to someone, oh, I'm working with kids with autism, people say, oh, that's amazing. Oh, you must be so patient. Oh, yes, yes. yes, yes. You know, you must be, I'm, I'm not patient. That's what makes me good. Um, but, you know, and they'll say, that's so incredible of you. And oh, that can be so hard. In Ghana, they're saying things like at this time, what's autism? And oh, you mean those kids, those kids who are possessed? You, right. those are the kids that you talk to. Um, and it's a, it's a rather serious thing to so, be communicating with these kids. So at that time, were you, did you, were you coming to the realization? I, I have to imagine you were probably the preeminent authority on applied behavior analysis at, you know, yeah. the, at least comparatively speaking. Right. Uh, yeah. And so was that not, a weird not, realization? Not. Like, like you're saying like, wait a second, you know, uh, you want me to, uh, you know, I, yes. you know I, I'm sure they, they were probably like you were, like you were saying, you want to, you know, kind of check out this school to learn from them. And I, I right. have to imagine that they were like, uh, no, you have this the other way around. Yeah. At a certain point. And so we worked together, you know, I worked in that, I worked in that center. Um, and I thought, you know, let me just teach you the few things I know. Let's, um, let's, let's just do a couple of different things. Let's teach some kids some things. Let's teach them to, you know, eat with silverware, name some flashcards. I don't know, you know, like, what do they want to learn? Let's just teach it. I've got some skills. We'll see what we can do. Um, and so then what I did is I, I just said, you know, really though, I'm not a BCBA. I'm not the one who should be training you. And there, you know, there was a BCBA that I was working with in Seattle who was coming in from time to time, but I went online and I said, let's just find, um, a, uh, sorry, let's just find a company or an organization that will come and train you guys. How hard can this be? You know, like what a great opportunity. You get to come to Ghana. It's a beautiful place. 
Um, and so I made a few phone calls, you know, I had my like, hello, Africa phone card, and it would be like, your units are finished. Goodbye. And I was like, ah, you know, and I'd call back. Um, and I went on my, I always tell people, you know, the, the caveat to this is this was a dial up internet connection in Ghana in 2003. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have the fastest internet, but I was finding some things, you know, and I was reaching out to people in the U S and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, you could do that, that would be a cool opportunity. You know, here's what our rates would be. Um, and it wasn't even so much the rates that I was concerned about that part. I felt like I could kind of figure that out. I've always been a good fundraiser, you know, <laughs> like whatever. My bigger concern is that that was their rates for coming and training for two weeks and leaving. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what are we supposed to do after that? You would never come you would never come to this kid's house in Seattle and train me for two weeks and leave and say, she's all set. We're good to go. Um, but that's what they were offering in Ghana, you know, obviously because they didn't have the bandwidth to take on an entire center and train everyone. Um, right. and so I was, you know, I remember I was, um, speaking on a panel once and somebody said, well, how did you, how did you start? Why? Why? I guess the question was, why did you start the Global Autism Project? And I say, well, you know, if you talk to my dad, um, he would tell you she started it because she didn't know any better. And what I would tell you is that my dad is exactly right. <laughs> you know, it was sort of like, here I am in Ghana. We need services. Seems like there's nothing out there that's going to help us. Um, so it was called the Ghana Autism Project in my head and heart for a moment. And then I went online. I thought maybe someone from another country outside of the U.S. will be more sensitive to this and they will come to Ghana and help us. So, again, dial up Internet connection 2003. Not, you know, not a whole lot on the Internet compared to what's there today. Sure. Right. Especially for our field. Um, and and I was just finding more people around the world asking for more of the same and saying, well, anyone come here and train us. And, you know, all these kind of message boards, with these desperate stories about what was happening. And I thought, well, that's easy. Um, we'll just call it the Global Autism Project. And we'll start in Ghana and we'll go all over the world. Um, and there's a video from back in 2005, this idealistic little young girl named Molly Olapini says just that, you know, we'll start in Ghana and we'll go all over the world. Easy peasy. Easy peasy, right? No problem. I had no idea what that was going to look like. I had, I, I had no idea, but I knew that there was a need and I knew that the best people to work with these kids with autism in Ghana were the Ghanaians. And I thought that's probably the case in other places. They know the culture. They know the, um, you know, they know the expectations. They know the social norms. They eat this, um, they eat a, a couple of different local foods in Ghana and you, you eat it with your hands. And quite frankly, I didn't know how to eat that food, you know, but they did. I learned, obviously, but I just, it was so cool to kind of be able to train these guys and get them to learn how to collect data and how to change things, um, specifically kids' behavior, um, and to be able to do that but be able to apply what they, what they already knew um, these kids needed to know. And I think um, one of the other very interesting things that I was noticing is that kids who, to me, as someone who speaks English, seemed like maybe nonverbal or what they're saying doesn't, I can't really understand it or not nonverbal, but um, you know, they're, they're saying, I wasn't sure if these were just random vocalizations no, they're speaking this language called tree, which everyone in Ghana is speaking. Not everyone, but, you know, sure. people at the center. So they're like, oh, no, no, he's he's speaking tree and asking for the bathroom. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, so it was sort of like it kept being kind of like thrown in my face how ridiculous it would be for me to be the service provider in Ghana mm -hmm. um, on every level. Um, but that was really that was the organization that is the organization today. It's predicated on the idea that the best people to work with people with autism in their country are people from that country. And that the only thing that stands between them being someone who wants to be a really good therapist and being a really good therapist is training. I see. And so that was kind of the like, how hard can it be? <laughs> so where did it go from there? You know, that was, you know, we're talking about, you know, 2003, 2005. Now it's 2017. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. How, how have you grown since that, you know, from, from uh, then to now? Gosh, I don't even know. 
I was, I was just meeting with someone at a lunch meeting today and he said, you know, how long have you been doing this anyway? And I said, Oh, it'll be 14 years this fall. And I'm like, what? Where'd that time go? Right. Um, but I'm not old enough for that. Um, so yeah, it'll be 14 years this fall. Where did it go from there? So we spent, you know, I remember, uh, we spent a lot of time in Ghana, um, learning what to do and learning what not to do. Um, we made, I would say we made some of our best mistakes in Ghana. Um, and really those mistakes were around sustainability. And those were the lessons that we were learning over and over again. You know, we had, um, initially I had thought, you know, people will come and they'll work with the kids. And then I, as I said, I thought, no, 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 like, you know, local people should work with the kids. Um, initially I think I thought it was about getting donations, getting toys and things like that donated, um, and realized that that's not, that's not very sustainable because I remember there was this one particular toy, little Sesame street characters. We've all seen it. It's like a shape sorter and Elmo pops up and a shape sorter and the grouch pops up or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one kid would do anything for this toy, anything. Well, guess what? That toy broke. And it's not all that easy to get Sesame Street toys in Ghana. Right. So I realized pretty quickly that by getting these local donations and getting these American families and getting people, you know, to send the, it was it was ridiculous. It was a it was a terrible idea. Or say you're running a program and you have all these great flashcards and they're laminated and they're lovely. And this is like before it's not before printers, obviously, but certainly we weren't like printing and laminating stuff in the center, right? So then that flashcard goes missing. Well, now you're like, oh, that kid can't can't do that anymore. Well, no, 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 no. The, all the Apple flashcards are missing today. Oh, okay. You know, and I can't just get more like instantly here. So it was. Um, so it became pretty obvious that that wasn't a great idea. Um, and so we spent eight years in Ghana. Let's see, what did we do? We had, I had a BCBA move to Ghana. Um, that was a little sort of like too much too soon, I think. There was there were some admin pieces that had to come together. Um, and then so a buddy of mine from high school, from a small town in New Hampshire, as you've noted, um, and he was living in Mali in the Peace Corps. And he he believed in this crazy idea. He knows better than to not believe me, you know? <laughs> and so he came to Ghana, um, and he worked on the admin piece. He helped them do things like make brochures and use the internet and stuff like that. Um, so that we could then support training a bit better. Um, and so what we did in Ghana was we created a revolving door of international volunteers. And I think this is really important and useful for your listeners to hear because, it's very alluring to be part of that revolving door of volunteers like, oh, I'll go in and help for two weeks. Why not? You know, but without without some kind of ongoing training and structure, which is what we now have, um, you're you're doing just that. So it's like you go in and you're an expert in X, Y, Z. Great. And you go in and you're an expert in ABC and you want to know what they taught you about X, Y, Z. And you you don't really remember it was a while ago, but what are you doing? You know, and so you're not getting, not getting, you know, think about if we were working with a kid and a different therapist came in a few times a year for two weeks at a time. Oh, sure. We would never expect that kid to progress. We wouldn't even expect it. But yet, we have no problem. I have a big problem, but <laughs> the, the we um, of the world, you know, a lot of people will go in and work for two weeks at a time, a couple times a year, kind of on this idea like, oh, it's better than nothing. Um, I'm here to tell you it's not better than nothing. It's really not. And I think unless you can kind of set up something sustainable and ongoing, it, it can, it can be detrimental, honestly. Um, so where do we go from there? So we went, so we learned a lot about what to do and what not to do in Ghana. I remember I was speaking on a panel, at a little place called Google once upon a time. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and it said, innovate fast and fail faster. And I was like, nailing it. <laughs> you know, like, like we do that. We, we fail around here, you know, and for a long time, I think, um, I wasn't so enthusiastic about that aspect of our work. Um, but you know, we are the only organization trying to do this work in the way that we're doing it. International development is hard. 
Um, I think training in ABA can be complex and hard. Um, and we're doing it oceans and continents away from each other. So I was sort of like, of course we're going to fail and we're going to innovate fast and fail faster and innovate. Right. So, um, we realized, as I said, this revolving door of volunteers wasn't a great thing that we had set up. It seemed great. It seemed like a great idea. Send the volunteers directly to the center. They'll manage everything. Perfect. Well, you know, I, 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 Maybe uh, initially it probably sounded like a good idea because, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, kind of what you modeled the organization after. And there's all these other uh, charitable organizations like Doctors Without Borders, Habitat for Humanity, et cetera, where that is kind of the the model is at least as it relates to my understanding of it, which is not, you know, uh, not unlimited. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, so, okay, yeah, we're going to. We're going to go build this house or we're going to go, you know, uh, provide dental services for the, the village or, or something along those lines. So, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, you know, so it, it, it probably is not, it probably wasn't too far of a stretch sure. to, to try yeah. that out with behavior analysis as well. Yeah. And I think it's so funny because I was, I was looking over those questions with some colleagues and we, we all laughed. It was like, what did you model it after? And we're all like, <laughs> nothing, you know, like there was nothing, there was nothing out trial there. And error. I, yeah. We modeled, yeah. We, we did a really intense scientific process called trial and error. <laughs> um, and so around, Oh, I'm losing track of my years. What a strange thing to have happen. Um, I would say around, let's see, oh three, ten. I would say six or seven years later, um, we started being approached by other organizations around the world and asking for services. And one of them was Kaizora Consultants in Kenya. It was a very small organization at the time, um, led by an absolutely incredible human being, um, Nej Puja Panasar, who had lived a little while, um, she's from, from Kenya originally, had gone to college and worked with kids with autism actually in Canada for a bit and then went back to Kenya and thought, well, you know, here I am in Kenya here to be, um, you know, a teacher. And somebody saw on her resume that she had experience with autism and hired her to work with her son. And so I started talking with her and I started training her. Um, and you know, it it was, it was she and I, you know, we would, it's so funny because whenever I'm on these video calls, I, I think back because I see the little, um, the little camera on my computer. And I remember we talked about the standard acceleration chart, right? I remember like holding it up and being like this thing, do you see it? It's called the timing bar. Oh my gosh. Um, I know because we're in Kenya uses the standard acceleration chart. It's all my fault. Um, but you know, that's what I knew and that's what it was making. The kids are making great progress. And so it was this really interesting thing where I realized I'm somehow making more progress with this center in Kenya, just talking with them over Skype than we were able to make living in Ghana, you know? And so we also learned the lesson of, um, you know, I remember, at one point someone said, Oh, are you going to live in Kenya next? And I was like, no, you know, like I'm never doing that again. That doesn't build independence. You know, would you learn to brush your teeth if I brushed your teeth for you every morning? No. Um, and what happens when you live in the country is you start training people to, you don't mean to, but you start training people to show up to the, to the center when you're there, you know, the the expert from the other country. Mm -hmm. And so I knew, that is not what that was going to look like. So this was years ago at this time. The budget did not allow for flights to Kenya on either one of our side. Neither of us were paying for these plane tickets. So we continued for the first couple of years of that partnership, just Skype training. Um, and it was so crazy. And, you know, upload some videos and stuff like that. It was so amazing to go to Kenya. I think it was, it was two years later after that partnership started, the first time I got to go to Kenya. And I got there. And they were using the standard acceleration chart and they were teaching kids, you know, and it was, it was so cool. And I realized, I think in that moment that, that we were onto something here. So what can work? Well, what were some good strategies that you found talking to people over Skype from a, from a skill acquisition standpoint? Uh, You know, we, we've, um, th- there's an increasing interest in telemedicine or yeah. you know, telehealth or whatever. It goes by a couple mm-hmm. of different names and things like that. Uh, certainly Skype is, 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 can be one piece of that. 
Yeah. Uh, but and especially these days with things like Skype and FaceTime and Zoom and all these, you know, platforms that are out there, yeah. th- there is an increasing ability for uh behavior analysts to connect with others remotely. Yeah. Uh at the same time, obviously the need is is continuing to develop for these services. What would you say would be some some helpful strategies or what what did you find helpful in terms of you know teaching these skills in a, in what must have felt in a in a super awkward way like you said like holding a piece <laughs> of paper up and pointing and stuff like that you know um, can you talk about that i guess now that you mention it it did seem a little awkward <laughs> at the time it was just all about these kids and the progress they were making and um one of the things that was cool is puja had learned um you know just kind of basic dtt and these kids had kind of maxed out at some of their skills and so one of the first things that happened out of kenya was a poster on mastery versus fluency um and that was really a neat thing to look at um so i was specifically teaching for fluency so what did that look like i mean i was literally modeling it like okay so you you, you put it down you secure the student's attention you know and then and then i was literally modeling like go quickly go quickly good to good touch this do that you know and um so modeling things worked well at this point um, I, I don't know that I had any good strategies at that point. You know, it was sort of, I will say probably the biggest strategy I had was constant, consistent communication. I was always available to them. Um, and I would, you know, I would answer any questions they had. And, um, and that was, that was really, it. I mean, at this point I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't paid a salary from the global autism project. The budget was teeny tiny. It was just kind of, keeping like the few trips that we're running to Ghana afloat at that point. Um, and so this was, this was also, and also there's time zones, right. But this would also be awkward times a day. Um, and I will say, I think that's something that we do at the global autism project still is that we will meet, um, you know, my India clinician is on the phone at 11 o'clock on Friday nights because she's an amazing human. Um, but that's a good time for them in India. So accommodating the time for them versus having them accommodate for us, I think would probably be just a little take home from that. Mm-hmm. Um, we just find that in terms of showing up for phone calls, etc. <laughs> Hey everyone, I had to stop recording there for a second because one of our computer's battery was about to die, and I will leave that to for you to guess which one of us it was. So, um, anywho, I thought I'd use this as an opportunity to let you know that I have some CEs available. So if you're in need of type 2 continuing education and you have interest in topics such as behavioral economics, the ethics of self-care, and functional assessment and functional communication training, you can go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEs or just go to behavioral observations and look at the uh, look for the get CE tab at the top of the page and uh, you can follow the directions from there. I really appreciate those of you who have already uh, participated in those events. It really helps support the podcast and uh, keeps the lights on here. Uh, so it, uh, it's certainly much appreciated. So anywho, uh, I will be having some more CE, uh, CEs available, uh, particularly in the area of acceptance and commitment therapy. That's one of the more popular topics that we talk about here on the show. So stay tuned for that as well. And, uh, having said all that, let's get back to our conversation with Molly. Okay, Molly, um, we're back now. We had a little technological problem that we had to take care of, and you were in the middle of talking about kind of uh, telemedicine, telehealth approaches and things like that, some good strategies that you found that would, was working well for you, and you, you, you had another thought that you wanted to finish up on before we transition to another topic, so why don't you go ahead and finish your thought there. Thank you. Yeah. So I think one of the... I have seen this trend um, of telemedicine. I'm always excited about accessibility. Um, but I'm also, I'm also worried and concerned always about quality of services. I think that is the thing that was most impressed upon me when I was learning this. Um, and we have really, as the global autism project, we've really been a stickler about that because I think we should. Um, and I will say that while we were doing really cool, great training over Skype, nothing compares to what it looked like when our team started getting on the ground down in Kenya. And I think if you are doing telemedicine, if there's any kind of way to get to see the children, to see the family, to maybe meet halfway, you know, something, um, and by halfway, I mean halfway across the planet, if that, you know, if that's what it takes. But, um, 
I, I think really, you know, we rely on technology a lot here. Um, you know, we send our teams into the field three times a year and our clinicians into the field a couple times on top of that usually. So it's, um, or rather from now on, we're starting to do that now. Um, but it's a really important piece to us to get, to get on the ground, you know, boots on the ground. We always say like, okay, what do we think we're going into? You know, the teams come for orientation training, we tell them everything that we know is going on. You get boots on the ground. You're like, oh, what about that? You know, mm -hmm. so um, so that was just my last thought. So thank okay. you for that. No, hey, no problem. Um, and so we've been talking kind of generally about, you know, the Global Autism Project. And, and I was looking on your website in preparation for this interview. And it looks like you, at least as it's currently uh, made up of or constituted, you, you're you're doing a couple of different things. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of talk about what exactly is it that you, I mean, obviously we know you're in all these places and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, but what is it exactly that you do? What services do you offer and so on? Great. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, what is it exactly that we do? Uh, really, you know, the mission of the global autism project is to create communities that accept and integrate people with autism. And so what is it that we do? We train people. We really do. Um, our international partnerships are folks who reach out to us from other countries and apply to be our partner. And we train them both, you know, by this kind of telemedicine model as well as in-person visits. Um, we actually do that with skilled clinicians and volunteers. So people who have worked in the field, we actively recruit for professional diversity. So we're looking for people who are BCBAs 20 years into their career and RBTs who started last month and love it. You know, um, that's really the requirement that you do have to love it. Um, but <laughs> We, we love that. We love that about the team. So that's our skill core program. And that helped, that's the ongoing training. That's kind of our answer to the revolving door, right? It's still different groups of people going in, but they're all connected to this common organization, this common mission, this common work. Um, and then... And so just to uh, sure. pause there for a second, um, do you... So do you employ BCBAs or are they, uh, I know, I know there's some volunteers as well, or is it, is yeah. it a little bit of both? How does that, how does that work? Yeah. So our clinical team are employees of the Global Autism Project. Okay. Yep. Exactly. And so, um, uh, so talk about the, um, the different areas that you're operating in right now. How many... And I saw a map on, on your website and sure. uh, it was like, like stuff all over the place. So, um, yeah, stuff all over the place right now. Yes, that's a very, uh, very uh, uh, clinical term, of course, you know, uh, yes. but uh, or how we describe it. So how many how many countries are you in right now? We are currently in seven. Uh, we've recently added the Czech Republic to our list of partnerships, which is really exciting. Um, we work in Kenya, Nigeria, India, Indonesia, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Czech Republic. Wow. And mean? what are um, – I, I have to imagine there are some um, – you know, obvious language issues and things like that. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about how you guys tackle uh, that? You know, obviously you have, and you kind of alluded to that earlier with the the kind of native language of, of Ghana, um, or at least those individuals in that, that area of Ghana, certainly. Um, but how do you guys overcome some of those barriers if you're recruiting people from, say, you know, uh, North America or even yeah. Western Europe? Um, yeah. You know, how, how do you guys tackle that when you're sending people into India or other places like that, that, uh, you know, that may not be providing services in English? Great question. So, you know, when you run an international nonprofit organization and you're 14 years in, you better have learned to see every, every single challenge as an opportunity. And we really consider the language difference and advantage. We really do. We see it as an opportunity um, because while it's not that difficult to explain backward chaining back to me, it's a little more difficult to demonstrate it. And if you demonstrate it, and if I demonstrate it, and then you demonstrate it, then I'm able to see that you actually do understand what it is that this is. So currently, um, in many of our partnerships, there is somebody there who is fluent in English. Obviously, Kenya, Nigeria, they speak English, which is helpful. Um, Spanish is a language that 
people kind of know by osmosis, I think it seems like. Um, certainly you're right, though. In a place like Indonesia, Bahasa Indonesian, we're very fortunate. Our staff clinician who talks to them every week is fluent in Bahasa Indonesian. So he's able to do that. Um, in India, we speak to them in English. But the teaching is in Hindi. So what we tell everybody is you need to stay one step ahead of a kid with autism who's learning how to talk. Um, and what was really interesting, we had a really cool experience in the Czech Republic. Our partner there actually speaks Russian. We're very fortunate to have someone on our team who also speaks Russian, not a whole lot of that around. Yeah. Um, and a very cool thing happened where she was teaching the, you know, she was teaching the word for blueberry and she was teaching the word for raspberry. And because the teacher was so good at teaching, I knew which, which one was a Baruka. <laughs> and I remember today, you know, it's like, if, if you're teaching this kid with autism, I should certainly also be learning what, what it is that you're teaching. Um, and so that has been a really, really interesting thing. Um, and I think that, you know, so much of our work is built on relationship and understanding and compassion. So on that level, it's very important that we're able to have deep conversations with our partners. Um, and that's why, you know, when we partnered with um, Indonesia and had the opportunity to have someone who does speak Bahasa Indonesian in Czech Republic and have someone who does speak Russian, which she speaks in the Czech Republic also, um, that was really important to us so that we can get to that. But in terms of the teaching itself and on the trips, we have people who travel, um, you know, we have people say, oh, do you have to speak Spanish to go to the DR and or Nicaragua? And we say, actually, no, um, but you you have to know what good teaching looks like. Um, and so that's been a very cool, that's been a very cool thing. You know, it's sort of like you look at the teacher and you point to your nose and you say, you know, what do you call, you know, you just kind of point to your nose and go like this, you know, put your hands up like, oh. and they'll tell you what it's called. And then you're like, all right, cool, let's go. <laughs> you know? I see. So. It's almost that language might be a barrier. Uh, yeah, or, or like, speaking yeah. the same language might be a little bit of a crutch. Uh, and, and if you see someone demonstrating the at least the physical uh, uh, yeah, topographies associated with good teaching, then it's probably yeah. you're uh, off to a good start there. So that's interesting. I didn't think about it as a as as, as an advantage. So that's that's a pretty oh, interesting yeah. <laughs> way to look at it single thing that comes that time zones what an advantage those time zones are you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll think about that next time i'm encountering a difficult situation this is actually an advantage um, it's a great advantage and right. what is here for me to learn that's what we teach our teams What's, what is here for me to learn i see i see i got yeah. it i got it um so we talked about language you you alluded to some you know kind of cultural perceptions of, of disabilities earlier you know when you mentioned that uh, uh, some of the people in Africa thought the children with autism are, I think the word you used was possessed. I did. Yeah. What is, is that common? And are there other kind of uh, misconceptions that you have to uh, contend with out there? And, and how do you guys, and if so, how do you guys deal with that? That is common. Um, and, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, in the U.S., we were blaming autism on mom getting a college degree. So we have to kind of remember that, too, right? It's like mm -hmm. we're not... Or the, the refrigerator moms, you know. Yep, exactly. Yep, and, ca you know, and vaccines causing autism and all these things that... So when I go into another country and somebody tells me he has autism because he's been possessed, I say, okay, how do you know when he's hungry? <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. it's sort of like... All right. You know, and I, I handle it and we handle it kind of in the same way that we would handle it if I went into a house in New York City and someone told me that he has autism because he, um, you know, I, I don't know, whatever reason it is, you know, petted a, a zebra striped dog, I, you know, whatever it is. Right. It's sort of like, OK, well, what how can we teach this kid? How right. do you know when he's hungry? You know, um, and I think that the stigma is. It's common. It looks different in different parts of the world. Um, but, I mean, certainly it, it also exists in the U.S. You know, you know families in the U.S. who their children absolutely have autism and they're going, no, 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 he has a speech impediment. You're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's really a big part that's important to the Global Autism Project, too, is helping to work um, 
work within that within that understanding and shift it. And I think, you know, this speaks to the importance of having a local partner. There is something very powerful about a mom in India going into a local coffee shop with her 15 year old son with autism and saying to people, Oh, he has autism. Do you have questions? That is so much more powerful than me going around and saying, I know you think bad karma causes autism, but you're wrong. Right. No, no. Like, why are you going to listen to me about anything else if I don't even know that bad karma causes autism? You know, it's like, so, and when people say to me, what's the cause? It, you know, it's not like I can say, well, it's not bad karma and it's not this. And, oh, we don't know what it is. You know, it, right. it's, like, well, how do I know it's not bad karma? I don't know. Who am I to judge that? You know, I'm, I'm not going to judge that because that's, you know, what I'm, what I'm going to do is teach you how to teach this guy. Um, and teach you how to talk about autism, certainly, um, you know, and give you, certainly we can have a conversation and figure out what would be, what people would be more open to hearing. But I mean, I was not going to be the person in Ghana saying you're wrong. If you think kids are possessed, that would have gotten us nowhere. Right. You know? Right. You like, would have ostracized you know yourself. That. Yeah. Like she doesn't even know about that. Like, why are we listening to her about anything? Um, and you know, I also found that, and I remember a couple of kids in particular that, when you teach them functional communication, it's a little bit harder for the family to believe that this kid is possessed and that they can't communicate with this kid ever, you know? So, um, so that's, that's kind of how we deal with it, but we're really, um, yeah, we, we don't judge people for what they think causes autism. It's just not, it's, you know, so you just focus on treatment. We do. Yeah. yeah. You probably win, win a lot more friends that way. Well, and I think all the thing is outcomes. about hope, right? I think if, if you had to sum up what it is that the Global Autism Project does, it provides hope to families and teachers around the planet. Mm -hmm. And in a place where there is not hope, these kids don't have a whole lot of opportunity. I can imagine. So, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, how, uh, so you're a nonprofit, and yeah. um, so I have to imagine there's some uh, development activities that go along with that, uh, and, and at the risk of asking questions that are none of my business, but, you know, for those, for the, um, you know how are you guys funded? Uh, do, you know, do you have to, uh, you know, engage people uh, for, for, for donations and encourage philanthropy and things like that, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So a lot of our fundraising actually comes from our skill core members. Each person who travels with us raises $5,000. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty significant chunk of our budget at present. Um, and then we also have a monthly giving program called compass. So we have monthly donors, um, and we have about 300 monthly donors currently. So the next thing for us is getting into major donors and getting people, um, you know, who want to be a part, who see this as a movement and they want to be a part of a movement. They want to be a part of creating a world where people with autism are accepted and integrated into their communities. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's that. We also do some, um, we sell some continuing education units. So it's kind of like CEUs for a good cause, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's what we, that's what we have going on for the most part. I see. And can you just get, I'll mention this both before and after this conversation, but in case I space in, can you mention the, uh, the, the, the website again? It's, uh, what's it? Well, sure. Just, the go website ahead. is www dot global autism project dot org and you know i can tell you that autism is getting more well known very anecdotally because back in the day i used to say it's global autism and, and autism is a-u-t-i-s-m now everyone's like i know how to spell autism <laughs> <You know? laughs> We all know what autism is, Molly. I'm like, oh, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, very anecdotally, but that has been a shift that I've noticed for sure is that, you know, people people know about autism these days. And yeah. I think it's great to be aware of autism. I think it's very important to, to start talking about acceptance. Um, we employ adults with autism, actually, at the Global Autism Project, and they're awesome. And I think I... If, if people listening to this are business owners and you could change one thing that would increase your staff morale and increase your productivity and, um, you know, help you just have more fun in your office every day, I, I would highly recommend 
employing autistic adults, honestly. Um, it's, it's an outstanding thing. And I think for us to stand here saying that we want to create a world that's inclusive and accepting, um, we have to start in our own office. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, and again, I will put all that information in the uh, show notes uh, along yeah. with the, uh, the URL for the uh, globalautismproject.org right. website. And so you can go to behavioral observations forward slash and just look up uh, global observation, uh, excuse me, global autism. And, uh, it'll pop up in the, in the search bar. So um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things. So I want to kind of get back to the technology piece. Um, oh, yeah. So are there, you know, you talked about using Skype as, as a resource and, you know, you're kind of a, a, a professional Skype user. And uh, yes. are, are there other uh, pieces of technology that you guys have used to kind of manage this sprawling you know, yeah. organization? Yeah. So we actually um, received a generous donation from Behavior Imaging Solutions. Um, and I, I met these guys many years ago. And at the time, this shows you how long ago I was doing this, it was described as TiVo for real life. Um, and so it records, it's always recording and you can push a button to get it to go back and save the last 10 minutes that it just saw. Um, and so that was, that's TiVo, right? Call that a DVR these days, I think. Mm -hmm. but, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the little logo, right? With the little TV and the, the, yeah, remember, with the, the remember. ears on it. I know. So funny. Um, so that, so that's something that we've started rolling out with a couple of our partners, behavior imaging solutions. Um, we keep file, it's HIPAA compliant. We keep files in HIPAA compliant. Um, we use, uh, we're shifting over now to probably box.com. That's something that works well. Um, what else do we have going on tech wise? I do a part, a quarterly call with all of our partners and that call is done over zoom. Mm -hmm. Um, we find that zoom works really well internationally. Um, but you know, I mean, Matt, you and I, you and I had some tech issues, you know, you're calling the CEO of an international organization and, my Skype's not working today. <laughs> That's right. Or FaceTime or, uh, you know, <laughs> fill the blank. That kind yeah. of thing can happen, you know. So that's another thing I would say about telemedicine is allow, you know, schedule more calls than you think you're going to need for one. Um, and for two, just go ahead and give yourself a 30-minute buffer because it can sometimes take, you know, 30 minutes to connect for whatever reason, especially with time zones and countries and, um and there's also a couple of, I think I was talking with someone in Saudi Arabia recently and Skype didn't work for that, which was, might've been just him, but you know, so there's things like that that are considerations as well. I don't think Google works in China these days, you know, so we have to kind of figure that out. We rely a lot on technology. We rely a lot on social media. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's that. Yeah. I know you see that you guys are are active on uh, like Instagram and Facebook and things like that. So you yeah. know, certainly getting the word out from a, you know, at least marketing and um, a visibility perspective. So uh, very well, cool. I think we, you know, we have a responsibility to do that because there are people all over the world. I have literally met parents who are contemplating suicide and murdering their child with autism because they have no hope. And they have no idea what's out there. So we have a huge responsibility as the Global Autism Project to make sure they know we're here. Um, and I think that that's what it really comes down to. And we've actually met, I think, two or three of our partners now via Facebook. That's where they've connected with us, you know. So, um, but I mean, even if you spend time in the um, some of those different ABA groups on Facebook, you'll see people in other countries saying like, please, someone, you know, and I love it when someone's like, what about the Global Autism Project? You know, and inevitably mm -hmm. we take the conversation offline and, and it's great. And I think honestly, we have a responsibility to be out there. And I think, you know, honestly, as a, as a field, we have a responsibility to be out there um, because we need people to get that, that there's a very effective way of teaching people and everyone has a right to an education. That's a, you know, that's a UN human rights convention, uh, whatever it's called convention in a person. What's it called? The, whatever. <laughs> it's a human rights, <laughs> it's a human right, according to the UN. I can't remember what it's called right now, but yeah, everyone has a right to an education. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Wow. That's uh that's pretty heady stuff there. So, um, you know, I have learned a ton in this uh, short time we've been chatting here. 
Um, but before we uh, yeah, sign off on this uh, Skype call that uh, we finally got going <laughs> um, earlier on, um, do, you, do you have any parting advice for students of behavior analysis or people getting into the field or newly minted BCBAs, especially those who might be thinking about you know, doing this type of work? I have advice to everyone on the planet that is say yes to an opportunity. You know, I, I often think, what if I had thought, oh, nah, I don't want to move to Ghana. Or, nah, I don't think I want to work with this one kid with autism. Where's that going to lead me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and not only has that led me some pretty exciting places, but that's created some pretty incredible opportunities for, you know, we've had over 200 Skill Corps members over the years um, or travel with us. wasn't always called Skill Corps. Um, you know, we have partners in seven places. You know, you think about the ripple effect of just that, that one yes. So I think that's my that's my parting advice. You know, that's that's pretty interesting you say that because especially those of us in behavior analysis who are, you know, kind of trained to be skeptical of things yeah. and to think about I mean, I can reason myself out of doing anything, you know. It's like but Great let, me, job. <laughs> let me consider all the angles and let me think about all the things that can go wrong and et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I would agree that saying yes to things is uh, certainly one pathway to kind of force you you know, kind of out of your comfort zone into into some other things that, yeah. that you know, are, are potentially interesting. And, and in this case, you know, certainly, you know, led to some wonderful developments. So um, on that note, Molly, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and Thank sharing you. uh, your story and the story of this, you know, really cool uh, organization. And uh, hopefully we can have you back to give us some updates from time to time. Oh, absolutely. Have some of our partners. They have cool stories. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. You know, one of the fun things about doing this podcast is talking to people doing really interesting things in the field. And, you know, this episode was no exception. So I hope you really enjoyed that conversation with Molly and really take to heart that whole notion of saying yes to these opportunities that pop up. And, you know, that's really one of the reasons why I ask people how they got into the field, because oftentimes it is a result of saying yes to these things that may be, you know, maybe uh, nerve wracking or scary and things like that. So if you're uh, given an opportunity to do something pretty cool and it's, uh, you know, kind of pushing you out of your comfort zone, sometimes that's where the real, you know, magic happens, not to get too kind of uh, woo woo or new agey on you, but, uh, you know, I have found in my experience that that's where um, a lot of fun stuff happens, a lot of new opportunities open up. So, anywho, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I have. And if you have a second and if you enjoy the episode, head on over to iTunes and uh, give a rating and review, or even better, you know, share this episode uh, with uh, like minded friends and colleagues. If you want to post it on your Facebook wall or share it on your your, uh, your Instagram or whatever, uh, that would be awesome too. So until we meet again in session 29, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.